I'll get started. I guess the the modus of uh, the space will likely be that uh, I'm going to just uh, you know introduce the concept a bit. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, share the article, just what I did, and I'm gonna open the space right away from for people to um, come on stage and have questions, and you know, so we'll we'll move in small stages uh, for this one. So uh, with that uh, on the uh, screen, I'm gonna share the article. So, so uh, you know, the idea behind this uh, is generic. So, um, the article is titled uh, "When to Stop the Trading Strategy." Uh, we often see, uh, you know, when you try and search for an answer to such a question, you will see, uh, you know, a common heuristic being used that um, if your strategy hits uh, twice the drawdown of your historical uh, backtest, then it's a good point to stop trading that strategy. And uh, you know what I tried to do here was kind of um, walk through an, an approach, which is generic in nature, which is you know driven by Monte Carlo analysis. Uh, and then you know we took some example. I took some example of uh, a very popular 920 standard strategy. Um, and then you know I walked through uh, um, how 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 to manage that. Okay, so. <clears throat> With that said, I have, uh, you know, if I, anybody has any initial questions, I'm going to just allow uh, a couple of people to get started uh, just to see if there are questions. So I have a few requests I'm going to allow. Let me see. How do I manage this? Uh, okay, request. Okay, so I'm going to allow Himanshu first. I'm not sure if you have a question, Himanshu, but okay. yeah. Himanshu, if you can, if you want to speak, Please go ahead. Um, anybody else who wants to speak right at the front can come in and speak. Otherwise, uh, we'll go on. Manshu? Uh, is it me? I don't know. I can't hear him. So I'm just going to assume that uh, uh, he's, he's not going to be uh, in the same screen. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, I'll move forward. Okay, so uh, let me get started. So the the uh, uh, so you know in the article when I you know if you have the article in front of you or if you go to my timeline you can read that article set it up in front of you. I start by introducing what a backtest is, which is not a uh, you know it's which is something very standard for a lot of people who uh, who are connected to me around on the Twitter back on the Twitter space. Um, Twitter space or Twitter following, you know, or people who follow me or who I follow. So, you know, for others who are, who might be getting started for the first time, uh, the article gives a very initial introduction of a backtest. Is um, essentially what it does. You know, if I want to explain it here quickly, uh, what a backtest is trying to do is, let's say you have a few set of rules that you want to test how they would behave in the market or what you expect the market to react to. Or you know uh, probably provide you a positive PNL, um, and those those rules you know you you think you want to trade those rules. So for example, let's say a moving average crossover, or you know let's say uh, RSI and moving average crossover goes above this or that level, then you want to buy versus you want to sell. So a backtesting framework allows you what it allows you to do is set your rules on the historical data, and see how would it it have performed on your historical data. Uh, you know, you can always change the parameters of your rules. So, for example, you can change the moving average period, RSI period, look back, crossover, whatever you want to do. And the output of a backtesting report is generally, output of a backtesting exercise is generally a report which has um, equity curve, PNL. So, you know, profit and loss of individual trades, profit and pro loss of aggregated trades, uh, accumulative equity curve. Uh, Maximum drawdown, some risk metrics, sharp ratios, Opino ratios, Kalmar, uh, uh, comp compounded annual rate, uh, returns, uh, Kaggle, and so on and so forth. So there, there are quite a few things which can uh, come out of a back test, and I don't want to spend more time on that. Uh, essentially, my article also just introduces that um, in a very brief uh, fashion. 
uh, again that you can uh, you know you can see on the screen right now if you are on the youtube or you know if you go back to the article you'll be able to see that introduction um essentially uh, one of the couple of you know most important or most looked met metrics in a back test are uh, the maximum drawdown and the sharp ratio so maximum drawdown is uh, worst situation peak to trough drawdown so for example let's say you started with 1 lakh rupees or 10000 dollars whatever your denominated currency might be and let's say you make 20% return so let's say you 1 lakh goes to 1 lakh 20000 uh, so now you have a 1 lakh 20000 as your high high equity curve or high watermark now from there let's say you lose 5000 rupees so you come back to 115 115000 uh, or 1 lakh 15000 rupees um and then let's say your strategy recovers and then you make a new equity high of 140 or 1 lakh 40000 so essentially this drop from 120 to 115 is 5000 rupees or 5% of your equity or starting equity is your drawdown um and you know this can happen many times in your uh, in the space of your back test uh, once twice 10 times and um, essentially a maximum back test a maximum drawdown is the worst situation of this drop in the premises in your um, historical period and that's what back test gives you it gives you that maximum drawdown which people look at um, a lot as a as a tolerance for you know pain you know how much how much money can you lose before you start making money or you know how much money in the back test you lost um and then sharp ratio is another ratio again i won't go much in the deep uh, deep into that but essentially it's um, your returns divided by the volatility of returns um you know somebody actually dm me a, a while ago um, today itself actually um asking uh, what kind of risk free returns you should use for a sharp ratio or you know some constraint so the only thing i would like to say is sharp ratio by definition is uh, you take the return the total return of your portfolio on an annual basis if you are looking at an annual sharp now uh, you subtract the risk free return or you know a return that you might have been able to generate without taking any risk so you know for your indian markets that's fixed deposits or for us markets t bonds t bills whatever you want to call it um and divided by the volatility of the returns um so usually one consideration is uh, which your back test can uh, again customize is what kind of risk free returns you use um one point of view that i have also had and you know there it, it's it's in the literature as well that uh, you know so sharp ratio was developed for a portfolio uh you know in in a portfolio which can hold let's say equity cash and bonds as well and usually typically what happens is um if a strategy is investing only a portion of their uh, capital in equities and rest is usually in bonds they tend to match the risk uh, risk free returns by putting it in bonds so in our situation the kind of trading strategy we run uh we use completely risk capital re- leverage capital in which we don't have any allocation to bonds or risk free assets uh so essentially for us if we don't use that uh so yeah for the sharp portfolio you know sharp is was developed for a portfolio if you are using it for a you know say leverage portfolio leverage trading um, you know you can easily use uh, a risk free rate of zero essentially assuming that whole of your capital is parked in uh, a futures account which will not really generate a return uh, but that's that's contentious as well uh, and probably a topic for another day um, so i'll move on uh, essentially you know in the article so that's that's what the article introduces some back testing uh, introduction what a back test is how do you go from uh, back test to live so you know a typical path that somebody takes is you you have some rules you tested them out you have some data uh you coded let's say in python in ami broker trading view r matlab there are so many platforms you can use uh and then you go live with it you essentially study you say you know the results that you see in your back test you like it and then you go on and say okay i'm going to start putting live money on this uh and you start trading it now you know you might have often heard that your live results and you know some some of you might have experienced this as well that your live results start you know do not match the back test and one of the reasons is also that in a back test uh, appropriate cost considerations or appropriate assumptions have not been made but outside that uh, it's also uh, realistic to not have the same set of um, output returns or the live returns as your back test is because at the end of the day markets are evolving you know the 
effects that you started trading on may change, uh, may evolve, more people might start trading it. So there are many moving parts which affects uh, our trading strategy. And uh, that's why often you will see your live results are not absolutely or exactly matching your back test results. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, in research environment, systematic grading research, back test should be seen as a tool, as one of the features, but not the only research methodology. And again, you know, that's a, that's a whole lot of different uh, topics to uh, discuss on. Um, I don't want to spend more time on back testing, but, uh, you know, so with, with, not, with that, armed with that knowledge, then our question, you know, what we really want to answer is, um, when do we know or how do we decide that our strategy has lost its edge? Because you will see in future, like I said, in you know, you are trading, uh, uh, when you live, start live trading, uh, let's say your back tested result shows a maximum drawdown of 10% and then you hit the 10% in the first two days, what do you do? Because it's very unlikely that whatever you tested out last two days ago has dramatically changed within the first two days. If you really had an edge or if you really had an underlying effect that you wanted to harness, then it's unlikely that that will change right away in the first two days. So what do you do? What will, you know, what's your reaction? How do you, how do you cater to that? So that's the kind of question that, uh, you know, I wanted to answer and I'll, I'll be honest about it. What prompted me to do this? Um, I have a uh, suite of strategies which run on decibel capital and, you know, which is also on my website. Um, and then some of them, you know, I, I, uh, track the performance in a lot of ways and some of these strategies hit uh, a drawdown phase, which was after a really long time. So, um, you know, I had some very loose framework built with me and I kind of started formalizing it. And that's what got me interested in looking into, uh, the 920 strategy. Um, which is, by the way, one of the most popular, hated, loved, whatever you want to call it, uh, strategy of the Indian FinTwit. So I thought I'll do some analysis in that and see what the outcome might be, and that's where we are. Um, <clears throat> with that said, I want to just have a quick pause and see if there are any questions on this or if anybody wants to. I have uh, requests here. I'm just going to ask. I'm going to allow uh, people to come up and ask questions if they have. So, uh, Hari Babu, um, I'll, I'm going to allow you to speak. If anybody else, uh, else has any question uh, that I can answer uh, before we move on, I'll be here. It will be good. Hari, can you, can you hear me? If you want to if you have a question, please. Hello? Okay, okay, it's okay. Um, I, okay. I'm not sure if Hadi wants to speak right now. So, all right. Um, I'm going to move on then. In that case, I'm just gonna, um, uh, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, continuing further then, uh, so uh, 920 is starting. Okay, I have another request. Let me see. I just want to ensure that uh, people get the answer. Okay, Nikesh. If you want to speak, Nikesh, you can go next. Ankit, can you hear me? Yes, so I can hear you. I hope others can hear you as well. Okay, so my question is, uh, uh, I saw your paper in detail, and uh, I, want, uh, I was a little curious whether it would be ever be conclusive or we can reach conclusion to a certain extent that the the, the uh, subject strategy is no more usable or is no because it can happen there is a long drawdown period or long uh, periods when the strategy is not working and it is start working after that period so it, can we reach to any any conclusion at any point of time with the, all this uh, stuff yeah so 
so that's a good question and you know we'll probably address that to a point but for others uh, you know might not have heard this properly the question is that can we ever get to a uh, conclusion that whatever strategy or whatever work uh, that we have done uh, you know through this analysis gives a conclusive answer that uh, this thing is not working anymore so uh, you know this framework that we are talking today is one of the potential frameworks that can be executed uh, and it will honestly not give you uh, you know a very confirmed answer uh, but then you know it does uh, allow you to uh, give you know use one one way of analyzing the uh, the methodology really so we'll we'll talk about it um, you know once i introduce the framework um, you know for people who probably had a few questions on the framework itself and then we'll uh, and then we'll uh, address that question so fine thanks for that fine. for now thanks uh, deepak do you want to speak next uh sure ankit uh, my uh, i don't have any questions i just want to uh, you to know i think some people are waiting on uh, youtube and youtube is not working it's still saying waiting oh youtube is not working sorry guys let me check that um uh okay let me yeah thanks for that let me see i think i had started that uh let me see guys please uh, please don't mind holding you know what i think in the favor of um uh, keeping it simple for everybody i'm just going to leave out the youtube functionality for now and see if i can uh, continue on the i can always upload this video or recording if somebody else is there so i'm going to just give me a second uh why is it not starting please bear with me just a minute or so I thought I had started this. It says uh, okay. So I'm gonna stop the live stream on YouTube. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know it seems uh, the integration did not go through. So I'm just gonna continue on the uh, um, on the Twitter space itself. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to upload some of the recordings here as well. Sorry, guys. Um, so uh, okay so we have one more uh, requested uh, speaker option what's his name rohit rohit do you want to speak do you have a question okay that's seem to be the case and then we have darshan darshan do you want to or hello rohit, rohit is there rohit go ahead hello hi hi good evening okay. Uh, actually sir my question is that actually a lot of uh, now there is a lot of people are doing 90% stand okay so uh, maximum people are uh, putting stop loss at 30% and if the stop loss hit on both sides then how we can manage that type okay, of problem okay so we'll come to that we are not discussing the strategy right now so we we'll, you know i'm just trying to make sure that uh, the framework is cross explained we'll come to that later thank you for now um okay i'm just going to i'm just going to move on i guess for now uh, or maybe i'll have uh, darshan ask the question or darshan if you have a question about what we've been discussed so far not about the strategy or not about how to manage the sl uh, it will be useful otherwise we'll get to the questions later darshan hi sabko namaskar hey namaste darshan sir aapne bilkul sahi kaha ki ki कभी कभी क्या होता है कि अपन स्ट्रेटेजी के प्रति इतना मतलब कि डेड श्योर हो जाते हैं तो दूसरे कॉन्सिक्वेंसेज जैसे विक्स बढ़ रहा है या मार्केट ट्रेंडिंग है वो देखता मतलब कि बिल्कुल ब्लाइंड कर देते हैं अपने आप को कि नहीं नहीं अभी तो ये स्टडी अच्छी चल रही है तो मैकेनिकल होना जरूरी है पर जो दूसरी चीजें भी है ना कि अगर विक्स बढ़ रहा है या मार्केट बिल्कुल दिख रहा है ट्रेंडिंग है तो अपन केवल प्रीमियम खाने के लिए एक स्टॉप लॉस ट्रिगर होता ही होता ही है उसके अंदर तो स्ट्रेटेजी के साथ साथ मैं कहता हूं मेरा ये मानना है कि मैकेनिकल के साथ साथ कुछ थोड़ी सी गट फीलिंग या थोड़ा इसमें इमोशनल भी होना चाहिए न्यूज के प्रति या दर्शन थैंक यू थैंक्स थैंक्स टू दैट दर्शन वी विल अगेन डिस्कस दैट ओके थैंक यू ऑलराइट सो आई एम गोइंग टू कंटिन्यू स्पीकिंग अगेन सो फॉर नाउ द द YouTube 
uh, stream has stopped uh, for some reason i didn't realize it was not working sorry about that so we're just going to continue uh, the spaces so um, so if if you go to the article you know my reference to the article the nine it introduces the 920 straddle i don't think mujhe ye introduce karne ki zarurat hai everybody knows but for you know sake of uh, completeness it's a straddle in which you it's a strategy in which in the morning at 920 930 whatever time you sell an atm straddle or you know some slightly in the money or out on money strangles and you put some stop losses uh, either on individual leg or overall Uh, profit and so many other things and you have an exit time so you exit it out at whatever time you want to exit it so that's a very basic strategy and you know it's very popular there are many people who are trading various versions of that strategy uh, on the on the blog post or on the medium post you will see um, i created a strategy which was a 930 am uh, selling atm straddle on bank nifty with uh, 30% stop loss on each leg and exiting at uh, 315 pm now uh with that uh, you know i use stockmark which is of course the most popular and the easiest used to uh backtesting platform to use the, such a strategy or test it out and i created an equity curve which is again on the on the blog uh and it assumes a half a percent slippage and you know if you see the performance the performance is about 230 or 238 percent returns in over five years with approximately 12 percent drawdown so this is you know typically an outcome of a back test uh you create some rules we created three four rules and then um, you know it spits out this equity curve and historical trades uh, like the strategy has about 1200 uh, or so trades uh, in this back test period um with some drawdown and then i kind of floated this question that you know let's say if you are looking at the strategy if you're just looking at this equity curve which is a beautiful equity curve again on my uh, twitter profile if you want to go in the art, link to the article should be right there uh, and then you know would this be a good strategy and you know my answers when when i first read it was like yeah this is a good strategy uh, for whatever reasons um, so then you know a lot of people uh, you know who have interacted with they use these back tests and then they start trading it now what happens is when you trade it let's say like i was saying earlier as well if you look at the equity curve of that strategy so around mid of uh, 2020 i think this must be around uh, corona crash or uh, near about that time the strategy started plateauing a bit for a few months before it took off again i would assume this was the time when it was the covid crash of march and uh, you know late february march and early april um so let's say you had had back tested the strategy in starting of 2020 or before the covid crash you start trading it and right after when you started trading it things changed and you know the strategy started plateauing you trade it for six months and you will realize zero percent returns or five plus five returns or minus five is very flattish returns whereas in your back test you have a very beautiful looking up trending curve and when you start trading it suddenly flat so you know the obvious question then to ask is what happened did we did we mess up our back test or uh, has the strategy lost its charm and uh, that's really where this analysis of uh, when to stop trading a strategy comes in so um, in my article i actually outlined uh, two approaches a qualitative approach and a quantitative approach so let's let's talk about the qualitative approach in general first and then <clears throat> so we'll move on to the quantitative or statistical approach and again it's just one example so a qualitative approach is wherein you start looking under the hood you start looking at uh, okay you know you start thinking on what drives these returns why will the strategy make money uh, and please don't think theta decay is the reason this makes money it's one of the reasons uh, theta decay or wall decay or uh, you know uh, the volatility risk premium is definitely one of the aspects uh, but it's not the only reason why uh, such a strategy makes money but you know going stepping outside the 920 straddle realm uh, if you are trading a, a trend following strategy or if you are trading a pace trading strategy or if you are trading any other long shot strategy or any other format of arbitrage um, so the first the first thing and you know one of the most important things to do when you are trading a live money on a strategy is to understand what drives it returns what is the reason what what features or what uh, environment in the market or what regime in the market actually enables the pnl to be driven um and that's really the qualitative analysis bit of it to understand the driver of the returns can help you 
then uh, pile on quantitative analysis on top of that to really come up with a very robust answer. Uh, but you know, both of these approaches, qualitative and quantitative, are are not mutually exclusive and really essentially should be done uh, together. You know, hand in hand, one on top of another, or uh, you know, parallelly if you want to call it that way. Um, so my article again gives a small example of a trend following. And, you know, it has a gold chart. So if you're doing trend following in gold, you'll see the last few months that gold has been in a very uh, broad range. And if you're doing it on a daily time frame, you'll see you might not have realized any positive returns out of it. So does that mean that trend following on gold is dead? I don't know. This is one qualitative measure of it. And, you know, this will go for all of your stock trading. Uh, you know, let's say you're doing intraday stocks as well, or uh, mean reversion portfolios. It, you know, this analysis helps you understand what drives my return. So, you know, if we then talk about 920 straddle, uh, what drives it returns? And I think there was a very uh, interesting uh, set of threads. Uh, I think last week, uh, uh, one of my friends, Roy, I don't know if he's here on the space, but I hope he listens to this. He's, I think he started it and then a lot of uh, different different uh, Twitter handles, uh, uh, you know, responded to it. One of the very good ex- examples, answer was given by uh, the handle Anand, Anand Abel, uh, the conservative trader. So, uh, so, you know, if you think about it, the, the reason 920 straddle makes money, if you think about the rules of the strategy, and I'm just repeating his his words, and of course, with my bit, bit of my understanding, uh, if you do qualitative analysis of a 920 straddle, so what happens is you let's say let's think about the days, you know, the type of days the market may uh, uh, you know realize. So um, let's say it's a range bound day, and you started a straddle in the day in the morning. Uh, throughout the day, uh, market doesn't go anywhere; it stays within a small range practically saving both of your end of the stop losses again this will also depend on what kind of stop loss you've had a 10 percent stop loss has a higher chance of getting hit versus a 30 percent and a 40 percent but at the at the under, other end a 10 percent stop loss will only give you 10 percent loss on your premium whereas a 50 percent stop loss will give you a bigger loss but it both have their own pros and cons but assuming that your stop loss is not hit that means whatever the volatility environment or you know the IV environment or the delta moves or the underlying uh, moves were for the day did not hit any of the stop losses and then you kind of you know hoping as the day passes and depends on how close to the expiry you were as the time value of the option reduces um, you know it will probably both these legs will reduce the value and since you have sold them you'll probably be able to realize some return in the, in the end of the day uh, and again you know this might you know in a in a non-technical or non, uh, in, a, in a very simple way, this is what DK is attributed to, even though DK has a lot more um, aspects to it. But, you know, for a simple, to keep things simple, let's say this is the DK. So your standard DK is through the day. Uh, the volatility did, did not spike up. The market did not take a trend direction. And you are able to make that return. So that's one driver, you know. So if we think about 920 straddle, um, I would say that, VIX or the IVs or the IV curve not spiking up through the day combined with uh, a non-directional or a range-bound movement of the index will likely drive my return for that day, for those kind of days. Um, on the other day, there are uh, there might be days when in uh, market starts trending. So, you know, it opens gaps or not, not gap, let's say within first 30 minutes, 45 minutes, markets start trending in one way. In that case, what will happen is one of the legs will go off. Uh, let's say the market is trending up. So your uh, short call will uh, probably hit the stop loss and you will be left with short put. And throughout the day, as market keeps on trending, this, this option will keep on getting more and more out of the money. And, you know, the value will decrease and you will again make money. So that's another kind of days. Uh, wherein this will make money. Uh, so these are the two broad PNL attributions. These are two broad profit attributions, I would say. Now, somebody, you know, you have to think what will be the loss attribution? What kind of days is when this will make losses, right? So one of the one of the example is it will make loss on a range bound day if your IV spike. So let's say, you know, you with all the uh, war situation going on with Russia and Ukraine, uh, let's say the market is range bound, it's not moving, even though in a war situation, you will expect 
some sort of market movement but assuming you know uh, or let's say let's there, there's another day let's say it's budget day you know pre budget era the market doesn't know which way to uh, people don't want to take the additional risk but they want to hedge out their portfolio so they will buy protection both on the buy side and the long side which will essentially lead to increased ivs or increased premiums which will lead to increased ivs uh, so essentially you sold the straddle in the morning market did not move but ivs went up so what will happen is even though markets remain directional uh, in non directional and your none of your call or put legs have hit their uh, stop losses as such or both of them might hit the stop losses essentially the iv is going up will mean both of them will hit loss stop losses even though market did not go up so that's really one environment or one loss attribution environment where in your ivs or volatility pre, uh, or vix you know these are not interchangeable terms but i'm using very loosely um, spikes um the other the other uh, situation wherein you know let's say your iv stay almost constant i shouldn't say constant but let's say within you know manageable range um and what may happen is market may be volatile so you understand ivs are different than volatility of intraday volatility of the market our ivs are implied vols or what the market sees as the expected volatility of your underlying option or your underlying asset on which the option is created going forward until the expiry right uh, and of course you know you can analyze it uh, and volatility is how the market is in today so it starts from let's say 35000 and back nifty goes down to 33000 then comes up to 34 then goes to 36 which is a large move right and in that case you know you know there have been different names for it akbc <laughs> was a very prominent name this day it's being w move or v shape moves uh, in which what will happen is both of your legs will get cut off so even though market remained at the end of the day probably started at 35000 and ended at 35000 but it might have hit both the legs you know so this price action or delta base movement will also hit your stop losses right uh, so uh even though the iv environment might not have changed so these are two broad uh, loss attribution so you know i think over the last few minutes we have spoken about the profit attributions which are a uh, constant iv environment a non directional move will make this or even falling in iv environment will make this money and b a directional move in which iv is probably remain the same or uh, fall and the market trends one direction will make this money for the straddle and the loss environments are a, an iv spike uh, with non directional move or even with directional move iv spike will likely uh, uh, hurt this uh, system uh, or strategy and of course uh, a v shape or w shape move will also hit this or you know uh, dead of the strategy so these are the profit and loss attributions that somebody should anybody who's trading the strategy should think about before they start putting live money and that's the qualitative approach that i talk about in my article uh, on the medium that you should really understand what will drive drive the uh, what drives the pnl um and then with that said then the other approach you can supplement this with this is good right what we have talked about is is good decent but like how do you quantify it how do you put numbers around it and you know i i will not be able to go into all the details of quantifying this completely but i'm going to introduce a monte carlo based statistical approach or quantitative approach if you want to call it to to kind of give you the first step of analyzing any strategy and i just put i just use the 920 straddle as an example but essentially it can be done with any any format of strategy so uh, let let me introduce that so what we can also do is and again if you are uh, listening to this i would highly recommend looking at the article because it might just help you understand what i'm trying to say here so uh one of the is you know when we think about a statistical approach we think about a lot of distributions it might be distribution of returns it might be distribution of any other um, uh, underlying process so a distribution is essentially uh, you know if you if you ever seen a histogram in your life uh, that's a distribution it just says uh, how many times an event occurs in a given space so for example let's say you have you know people might have seen normal curves or gaussian curves or bell distribution or bell curve you know in which you have this um, opposite 
V or you know an A kind of a curve without the uh, you know mid- middle horizontal uh, edge in it. Uh, essentially, you know you have this. Most of your returns are in the middle, or you know whatever the mean of your distribution is. Let's say normal distribution has uh, a zero mean, so essentially a lot of your realized returns are around zero, which is also the case in your trading as well. Uh, you know a lot of your returns might be between let's say half per- plus half percent and minus half percent, and then you might have some outlier returns. Uh, depending on what kind of strategy you follow so for a, for example a trend following as you might know has low win rate uh, which means it wins low but it has a high uh, high win amount on the win so it will win let's say 10 15% when it wins but it lose half a percent 1% so when you try and plot those returns on this on this distribution chart you will see a positive skew which means they will be a large uh returns on the right side of the curve the positive side of the curve but lower instances only one two or three returns such that but there will be lot more on the negative side so 100 returns which will be minus 5.5% or maybe 10 returns which will be minus 1% and so on so it has a positive skew which uh, positive skew which means the you know the bell curve has a fatter tail to the right and then you have negative skew which is opposite in case in which which usually the straddle selling or option selling falls into in which you will have constant small uh, winners uh, essentially um, let's say plus one percent plus half percent very frequently and relatively so you know high win rate uh, and relatively less large losses uh, you know so that will be the skew distribution or negative skew distribution of a straddle kind of a strategy and of course depending on your rules you can uh, create a uh, your strategy distribution you can hope to target a different distribution but again i don't want to get into those details so that's what the strategy what 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 the distribution is so and you know when we create a back test what we assume is one of the assumptions implicit in back going uh, taking live a back test is whatever distribution or returns we saw in our back test we expect that distribution to remain constant over a, you know uh, an observable next observable period it might be 3 months 6 months again um, i'm speaking this in a very loose fashion um, you know this might not be very accurate and you know to the t when it comes of the statistical terms but again that's really the assumption that and if you think about it that's what you expect right you've done a back test and uh, when you take it live you want to assume ki yaar you know my returns my performance from back test will replicate in my live returns and that's why you know you know statistically statistical way of looking at it is saying and assuming your distribution of returns is going to remain constant so you know uh, over, over the live return so essentially what that means is if my back test is 5 years it generated 240 to 38% returns with 12% drawdown i would want in the next 5 years or i would expect the next 5 years to have a similar performance that's an implicit assumption with taking a back test live uh, and that's all you know that's the case with our article and our analysis as well that we uh, we implicitly assume that uh, so with that said with that understanding that uh, you know when we take a back test live this is how we are thinking about it uh, the one of the one of the things to understand is the drawdown uh, the drawdown itself could be thought of a statistical process now what do i mean by that what do i mean by that and i think for this you really should we i let me introduce monte carlo simulation first and then i'll try and under, you know drive the point of why i say the drawdown itself might be a statistical process and what do we do with that analysis so what is a monte carlo simulation so monte carlo simulation is nothing but reshuffling the order of the trade so for example i'll you know i'll try and explain with let's say 10 trades you have a strategy which has only 10 trades and let's say you decide in your mind so whoever is listening that okay how do you think first four were winners first five were winners first two were winners alternate two were winners and losers or whatever way so you know that has you have a stream of 10 pnls that you are looking at now and when you when you you know let's say you create a equity curve of that you will create a back test kind of an equity curve which we have also seen in the article now if i tell you that you can reshuffle this what you can do is you know trade number 1 to 10 you you have these returns now you change the order in which they occur so let's say 
uh, in the first uh, in the first case our first return was one percent next next return was two percent and then minus one and minus two okay so let's say these were the first four return plus one plus two minus one minus two now i say you can reorder this in any way or form that you want so let's say each of you I'm sure if I ask you, you will come up with different ways of reshuffling it. And even though this is only four returns. So let's say for me, I will say, okay, I will say plus one, minus one, minus two and plus two. Okay, that's how I have reshuffled it. Now you see, it's the end result for both is exactly the same. It's 0% return, assuming there's no compounding. But the drawdown of both of these strategies is already different. So you have the same set of four returns with same daily returns. But depending on the path or depending on the order of the returns that were generated, your drawdown is different. So what I'm trying to tell you here is, you know, the backtest we ran is just one example. So if you have 1200 trades, like in our backtest, if you reshuffle the same trades, exactly the same trades, you will come up with, an, you know, the total returns will be the same, but your backtest drawdown might be different. And that's what Monte Carlo analysis is trying to do in a in a computational environment. It's trying to reshuffle that. So you know, I have a I have a graphic in my uh, uh, article which is saying, okay, you have starting point A, which is usually a zero percent return. You have ending point B, which is your whatever two for two thirty percent return. You can go from A to B from in many many ways in many ways. Uh, and you know, I just demonstrated one of that. And if you look at the article, I have an example in which I ran four simulations. I kind of reshuffled these returns four times. One simulation is one one reshuffling. Once you reshuffle, you recalculate a total PNL, which will exactly be the same. But since we are looking at drawdowns here, you reshuffle the returns and you calculate the drawdown. So on the article, there are four. Uh, color charts, I mean, four lines in the same chart and a black curve. So black curve is where our basic back test was. And then there's a red, green, blue, and orange line, which shows the four different simulated results. Um, and I noted, and, you know, I've uh, mentioned it, you know, if, if you look at this, the, the chart, you will say, you, you know, I've asked this for the reader too, that, hey, from these four uh, equity curves, pick which one do you think is what you like the most or which you would want to trade? And you will be amazed how many times people will pick something and then when I reveal the drawdown numbers, they'll be like, oh shit, this is not what we expected because what appears very beautiful to make it, I may not be very, you know, when you start digging deeper into it, might be very different. Uh, and that's what I did. So in the article, you know, I say, hey, pick up one of the equity curves, one of the colored equity curves, and assume you traded this live, and what will be the drawdown? And I'll give an example. So our back test has 12.75% of uh, drawdown, but these four simulations had uh, 11 and a half or 11.2, then second was 15%, third was 23.88 or roughly 24%, and fourth was 21.35% in terms of drawdown. So exactly the same starting and ending return, but very different drawdowns. Uh, and that's the point we are trying to make that our backtest drawdown, 12.75% is one possible path with the same set of returns that the strategy might have taken. Now, let me draw, you know, take a step back before we go further and say that, you know, there are many caveats to this, you know, depending on your strategy, uh, they might be clustering of returns, like trend following is once a strategy in which a lot of losers come together and a lot of winners come together. Even in this strategy, the 920 straddle we are talking about, your returns, expected returns on Thursdays are usually, or the option expiry days are usually highest versus, let's say, on Monday or a Friday. So, you know, when you reshuffle it, it's reshuffling in a way that, let's say, all Fridays get stacked together, all Thursdays get stacked together. So your returns might be, you know, not really true. And, you know, that requires a dig, digging deeper analysis. But, I'll you know, the, the one way to ensure that your analysis is still meaningful is uh, deciding the cutoff, cutoff of your drawdown distribution, which I'll come to in a few minutes. Uh, but essentially, that what, that's what Monte Carlo is. You take your realized returns or backtest returns, you reshuffle the order of those returns, and you decide and calculate what's the maximum drawdown for me in that returns. Uh, with that said, I, before we move on, I just again want to pause. I have a few uh, speaking requests. I'm going to take them and see if they have any questions before we move on. 
So uh, I have Saurabh and Himanshu. I'm going to um, allow both of you. Saurabh, if you want to go first. Hey, hey Saurabh. Yeah, yes, yeah, Saurabh. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. This is uh, uh, so. My point is, uh, you said that uh, when to stop trading it, uh, there are two methods. Uh, uh, we can say there are two points. Uh, let's say it's a flat or it's a negative return. It is generating over a period of time. Okay, that is one way of looking at it. But uh, can we do the reverse if it is making the negative return? Uh, can we trade the opposite of it? Okay. Sort of thanks for your question. Uh, but essentially, you know, uh, saying that trading the opposite side of the returns allows you, uh, you can trade it, you know, let's say strategy is going down, I usually short, but I'm going to go long is usually not the right way of approaching it. And again, today is not, we are not trying to discuss what's the right way. We are trying to, if you look at the read at the article, you will see what I'm trying to uh, explain here from a uh, slightly analytical perspective. Uh, I'll have Himanshu speak next. Himanshu? Yes, sir. Hello. Am I audible? Hey, Himanshu. Yes, sir. Hey, hey. Sir, I have a question. And then you said that in a Monte Carlo strategy, we can resample trade. We can resample also like that uh, we have a max drawdown of 20 days. Sorry, max losing day are 20. Hello? Uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if I... I'm not sure if I follow. So you're saying, yeah, we can reshuffle the returns, but you're saying you can also change the number. Can I, yes, can I just complete? Then you can answer, sir, please. Like that, okay, we can lose regularly for 20 days. Then we reshuffle the 20 max days which, when we lost. This also can be a max drawdown for that strategy. Right. So what, what you are, yeah, I, I get it. Okay. So what you are saying is, let's say our, uh, uh, if we are strategy has hundred days of returns, and then we pick up the worst returns of the strategy, and if we uh, assume that might be the worst case, uh, then that can also give you a good answer. Yes, that's actually a very fair answer. And uh, you know, once I explain the distribution, the drawdown distribution, or if you go to the website uh, on my article. You'll see I've mentioned the 36% number, which is essentially the right, the tail of the distribution. So what you are explaining, what you are saying is, uh, 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 is, is that, we, you know, what is the maximum possible way in worst scenario, worst, absolute worst scenario in which all of your worst losses get stacked up, what will be my drawdown? And yes, that's a very simple way of saying, yeah absolutely absolutely wrong or absolutely worse situation of what the returns this might strategy might be in. so yeah that's that's also a very simple way of doing it but that's usually the extremist case if you start doing this with all of your strategies you may probably never end up trading one but we'll i'll also cover that once i come to that i'll have uh, two more uh, speakers speak before i start continue further so kapil i'll have uh, we can have your question yeah, I, actually, my question is, question was similar to that uh, Himanshu. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can, can you can you repeat? Can you say your question? Yeah, my question was similar to that Himanshu. That uh, if we are uh, doing the stimulator, means in the initial stage we put uh, the maximum drawdowns like twenty days like that. Uh, so you said that in your article you said that the two times of your drawdown you need to exit okay um that's one of the popular yes that's one of the popular uh... yeah so in the initial phase where we get a maximum drawdown like uh, you have given 10000 types of uh, permutation and combinations so uh, it might be that uh, when a person enters at the right time of the drawdown phase because you don't know the market behavior how it's going to we also don't know what tomorrow happens so at that time initial stage when he when he reaches the maximum drawdown in the stimulator like 20 percent or 21 and the next uh, after uh, 15 20 or one month or uh, after that again he uh, uh, goes on means he sees the same drawdown uh, maximum of around uh, 
forty. So it it's it has been uh, more than uh, two times. So the overall profit uh, that you uh, said it two hundred and thirty eight percent that I accepted. But how will be the confidence of that person to continue with that yeah. uh, this yeah. thing? Yeah, thanks. No, I I get your question, Kapil. So let me try and answer that. So mm-hmm. the thing is that you know gaining confidence is the toughest part of a trading strategy, right? Um, and what I have tried to explain in this article is one approach. Like all these statistical tools which are used or which are provided, are just like you know if, if you enter a kitchen, there are different kind of utensils, there are different kind of knives and boards and what not you can't really come up with an answer with one of that number right and that's why i was explaining earlier the qualitative analysis that needs to be done and um, uh, you know quantitative can help you so to answer your question that you know if it hits if that happens i would say look under the hood if you know we discussed four of pnl attributions or two profit attributions two loss attributions of the strategy and then in what situations uh, is the strategy will be making money and will not be making money and you kind of marry the two you marry what were your historical drawdown or what was your simulated monte carlo 95 percentile drawdown again i'll i'll like to explain that quickly next in next few minutes and then ex- see what is the realized return and you know with all this information i wish it was that black and white to say yes and no the answer is really gray it's in the gray areas uh, and i'll you know once i'm i'm hoping in next 10 15 minutes i'll complete my uh, side of things and i'll have there are so many you know when i posted this on twitter i got so many good responses a very uh, uh, interesting ideas or and thoughts from people we we like, you know love to hope to discuss that on on the space uh but next few minutes i want to complete this so i'll have praveen speak next uh, praveen if you want to unmute yes uh, ankit yes, can praveen, you hear me please. yeah uh, first of all thank you very much for posting this article it has given a lot of new insights for me at least Uh, i am a systematic trader as as well as i do some discretionary trades as well and uh, as you also know it very well for systematic trader uh, we have to find uh, middle line perfectly uh, what i mean to say is if uh, we uh, as per your monte carlo analysis whatever 10000 uh, simulations you have done if we just take a, a favorable curve for us wherein uh, maximum drawdown is very less Uh, it could be in the range of say three to five percent. If we go with that kind of uh, assumption and put our position size uh, uh, in line with that, we will have very high risk of ruin. Whereas if we take extreme case, which is worst case, probably you have considered ninety five percentile. Suppose we consider hundred percentile, then in your article you have posted it could be around thirty two percent of the maximum drawdown. In that case, what I feel is for a trader we have to identify the middle line if we go with 31% as the maximum drawdown and with that consideration if we put our uh, position size accordingly then i feel we are not utilizing our position optimally to get the maximum return so here the question comes what percentile would be the ideal and i always keep on struggling to identify that uh, you have mentioned 95 percentile could be considered as uh, ideal Uh, because you have considered the worst of the worst scenario but what i would like to understand from you is my logic is very simple so as you explained in earlier part as well we are at first doing qualitative analysis there are some underlying logics wherein we are uh, putting in in this let's say case of 920 straddle so as you mentioned earlier as well in monte carlo simulation if we consider 10000 runs and in that if we consider last 5 percent and worst case scenario it will definitely consider choppy market scenario put together as well as as you mentioned earlier fridays and tuesdays where maximum losses are coming so that clustered result if we consider in our actual position sizing then we may not be getting optimal result so what i feel is instead of 95 percent i considering the qualitative uh, analysis which uh, at start we have identified to begin with to run this particular strategy what i feel is 
60 to 70 percentile should also be okay my logic for this is first of all as you mentioned 95 percentile it may not happen so easily because we are running this simulation for 10000 times right and we are considering 1200 trades which have occurred in last five years if we consider 10000 simulations in other uh, uh, in other words we can say that 10,000 multiplied by 5. So 50,000 years of trading, if we consider in that scenario, it may happen that the worst case 30% drawdown or 31% drawdown, whatever it is coming, it will come in 50,000 years. If we continue to trade this 9020 straddle, 920 straddle for next 50,000 years, then we will get 31% of the maximum drawdown, right? So, so in terms of probability also, 1 by 10,000, it hardly gives 0.01 percentile, uh, 1 percent probability to get that maximum drawdown. So what I feel is, instead of going for 95 percentile, if we go for, say, mid, not middle, considering factor of safety, say, 60 percentile or 65 percentile, that should be enough. That is point okay. number one. Another query which Praveen, uh, Praveen, I, I would Praveen, like you to... Praveen, Praveen yeah. let's, let's take one query at a time, right? So let me yeah. try and address some of these things. And I would ideally like to uh, continue the presentation so that anybody who has not seen the Monte Carlo simulation or might have questions around what if simulation is can get that answer too before we move to another question. But let me okay. try and answer uh, your question. So you're right in some aspects to say that uh, at the end of the day, this is a simulation. And if you take the worst possible simulation, that's really, you know, it's not the best efficient use of capital. And if we take the best possible simulation with least possible drawdown, 2%, 3%, then we have a very high risk of ruin. I completely agree with you. The reason 95 percentile is chosen, and if you, if anybody follows a, a bit more statistical analysis, you will see it's a very common cutoff, which is used in... Um, distribution analysis and some of the statistical tests, if you've ever done p-test, student t-test or p-values. The idea is that at what point do I distinguish something which is randomly happening with something which is happening because of a reason? And that's where you want most of your distribution or most of your uh, analysis to fall on the, within the 95% band. And that's where this 95% comes from. Now, I'll give you another example. In a normal distribution, you know, a one standard deviation from the mean happens 68% uh, of the time. Uh, two, two standard deviation, uh, I'm not sure what the exact number is. Is it 90% or something? It would be 94%. 94%. 94, 94, 94, 94, right. There you go. Three standard deviation is 97 or something. So, you know, that's also where these 95 percentile cutoff comes in. So when you're taking in the 60-70% uh, when you're talking about that, you're essentially saying one standard deviation, which is a much more frequent occurrence than you would otherwise believe it to be. So what do I mean by that? It's the, we are trying to here assess here when to stop it or when to see here something has changed. If I if, a, if on a one standard deviation basis, I expect 68% of the times within the one standard deviation, my outcome will lie, then the cutoff 60 to 70% will be much, much more frequent, which means we'll start reassessing that strategy for its tense very, very, very often. Rather than that, we want to be in a situation or at least the, the, the aim of this analysis was when to start getting concerned about it when to start thinking that something might have changed and for that you will need a slightly higher cutoff essentially which is this 95 percent so that's where the 95 percent uh, motivation comes in right uh, so with that said uh, no no disrespect to you praveen i just want to complete the rest of the article uh, so that we are all on the same page uh, anybody who might not have understood it will take another five ten minutes and then we'll have you know open-ended discussion on this uh, so coming back to the article, so, you know, we've uh, drawn four alternate paths or four Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, it was it was done to visually make people understand what a Monte Carlo simulation is trying to do. It's trying to create alternate paths. Uh, but, you know, the whole idea of a Monte Carlo simulation is... <clears throat> to run it, a, you know, a few thousand times. And the, uh, and the premise is essentially, we do not know the mathematical or uh, 
framework or mathematical model which drives these returns. So still, since we do not know, we just assume, we make a few assumptions. Uh, so Monte Carlo has an assumption of randomness, which means that all these returns that we have generated can occur randomly at different times, which is also not true in our case of 920 Stadel. We expect them to be more clustered. And that's why a more enhanced Monte Carlo might be a more suitable one. But again, like I said, this is a starting level analysis that I wanted to show. Uh, so yeah, Monte Carlo simulation has that assumption of randomness and will reshuffle it. It also has an assumption that your distribution will remain the same or the process which is driving the returns will remain constant uh, in, in the future and that's where you can rely on that which is again not the most you know uh, uh, coolest you know uh, realistic of assumptions in trading and if you've ever done any kind of mathematical or uh, modeling or statistical modeling on uh, financial markets you will you will understand that these are all with assumptions which often do not occur to be true in real life in real trading but again we 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 work with those frameworks if, if you ever look into black scholes framework which is the option pricing framework it also has the normality of underlying returns or the normal distribution of the underlying as an assumption which is never the case the you know the asset returns are more leptocurtic or you know has fatter tails if you want to call it that way so but nonetheless the frameworks are always driven with some assumptions so it makes our complex world slightly more simpler and slightly more understandable and that's what monte carlo is trying to do so uh, armed with that knowledge we just go ahead we we repeated the experiment four times and now we're going to repeat it ten thousand times instead of having five or seven returns in our stream we are going to do this uh, you know on the entire back test space and that's what the the second curve on the article comes out the monte carlo curves of ten thousand runs you will see the same set of returns could have taken so many different paths now Visually, you could have gotten the similar uh, understanding uh, within, let's say, even 100 runs. But if you look at the chart closely, you know, wherever there is, an, there is a curve which goes out of the, the whole big band, like if you think of this visual as a rubber band, and then you will see there are curves which will often go out of it, and they're all different colors, which means that deviation from, from like a whole cluster is also, also pretty prevalent. And that's what a large number of simulation helps you capture. It really helps you capture those tails. And then we're going to cut off the tails, which we're going to talk about. But better, what I mean by tails are extreme returns of positive returns and extreme returns of negative returns. And ideally, we want to cut off both of them. And, you know, hence the 95 percentile that we were earlier talking to. Um, but the more number of simulation, uh, usually above 1,000, 5,000 are good enough. And again, it depends on the use case, what kind of strategy it is, what kind of underlying. If you have 1,200 trades, you run 10,000 simulations, you're actually running a lot of simulations. Um, if you have only 100 trades, you might want to run a lot more simulations because you know, probably add some noise as well in your simulation. You can do a lot more with Monte Carlo. Uh, but essentially, in my article, I just did, I took the um, the base returns and this went on and uh, plotted the 10,000 returns. And after that, you know, uh, the next chart on that page is a histogram. You know, this histogram is the distribution. Now you bin these returns uh, of drawdown. So essentially, each curve or each simulation gave a drawdown, which was stored. And then we bucketed them. So, you know, the buckets are, let's say, zero to half percent drawdown happened less than one percent of time. So if you look at the curve, under one percent, under 10 percent drawdown happened less than one percent of time in each instance. And in the cumulative uh, curve, is the green curve on the distribution chart is also very low. As you move more realistic to between the 10 to 15 percent range, so 10 to 10 and a half is one bucket, 10 and a half to 11 is another bucket, so on and so forth. It plots the percentage of the total simulations which were within that small bucket. Uh, I don't want to get into how to plot a good histogram or, you know, you can change the bin sizes to change the percentage so if, for example if my bin size is 10 to half 10 to 10 and a half percent the number of let's say in 10 to 10 and a half percent we have two percent of drawdowns and 10 half to 11 percent of drawdowns we have uh, let's say five five percent of the whole simulations so when we club those two so between 10 to 11 percent we'll have seven percent 
so your you know num- the percentage of your simulation which fall under a bin size also is dependent on the size of the bin and that's also a, you know one of the analytical tool how to select the sizes you select small sizes to get more granular output a more granular view of your analysis you select slightly broader or wider bin sizes to get a uh, you know a, a more holistic or wider uh, view of the of distribution so that's what the article does then then it really plots that out and then it plots a few things so the blue chart the blue histogram is the distribution of the drawdowns in our simulation uh, then it has a, a purple vertical line the dotted line which was the original back, uh, drawdown in a back test which was essentially the black curve uska drawdown whatever it was it has a brown line brown dotted line which is the two times the drawdown so you know easily a lot of times you'll see people say back test whatever the back test drawdown is you double it up and you kind of use that as a benchmark to stop trading a strategy that's the brown brown line which is essentially in our back test uh, 25 and 1/2% and then there's a red dotted line which goes and meets the yellow, green line curve. so green life cur- curve think about is the percentile curve going from left to right so what it means is on the left x axis is your drawdown so if you go from 0% drawdown to 35% of drawdown green line and the right axis shows what percentage of your simulations had that much drawdown or less just like a percentile so green line you know the red line meets the green line at 95% cut off which is of course i've defined in my uh, in my analysis and essentially what it is saying is that 95% of the time in our simulation my drawdown was less than this red line which in our case comes out to be 21.99 or 22% roughly so again now when you look at this image this is just one analytical output and you know this is not i mean i'm not trying to say or i'm not trying to pitch that this is the only way and the whole and soul of coming up with this conclusion this is one one data based output which which can you you can analyze and you know so you can easily see in this strategy or the 920 strategy that we created uh this red line is better than or uh the brown line which means the two times drawdown was more conservative than what a monte carlo simulation gave us right whereas if you scroll down further and you know you can read through the rest of the article on that which explains some of these uh, and of course i can answer these questions if you want to uh, but essentially the last section of the article then talks about a word of caution so i have given another distribution curve from another strategy that we run at decibel capital uh, which has a historical drawdown of only 6% so essentially half of our 920 straddle but when you draw the distribution of it your 2x of drawdown comes to 12.5% but a monte carlo simulation comes at 15% so what i mean to drive by this what point i want mean to drive is if i'm trading this strategy and if i use 2x as my uh, uh, cut off where and i would stop trading a strategy then i'm not even covering 95 percentile of my simulation itself again I, again the caveat is it's not the only way of looking things and you know there are quite a few assumptions in this but i just wanted to bring out that um, you know that example in which so we have two examples now in which this 2x of drawdown has been conservative which is a 920 straddle and another example in which this 2x of the drawdown has been more aggressive than our uh, real back test and without doing some form of data analytics it's hard to come up with that assessment um whether this is more conservative or what to expect you know uh, so with that said that's what the whole article was all about um and i just want to cover one thing here which you know a lot of people uh, provided feedback on is about the clustering of returns so you know when we do a monte carlo simulation it is really stripping the returns of all its features so it doesn't know when the return was generated on a wednesday on a thursday or a friday or opex or budget day blah 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 it just takes everything as same return and then uh, or same same sort of process and then plots it out 
a more robust way of just doing 920 straddle based monte carlo is to probably group your returns on the days uh, and i would rather assume and suggest using option expiry as your benchmark rather than calendar day so option expiry day or day of the opex opex minus 1 or opex minus 2 so you know days to expiry as 1 2 3 whatever you want to call it and then do this and then do this analysis again because then what your kind of but again in that approach the assumption is that i'm saying my returns on on mondays are similar across my backend and if that's your assumption then by head go by all means go ahead and do that and you know even if it's that's not your assumption i would always say go ahead and do that you never know what you'll find in your data analytics a lot of time um, you do not know what to look at so you start punching you start you know creating these charts and graphs and come up with interesting observations which you probably would have never thought about a lot of time intuition is driven by data analytics and not the other way around a lot of time intuition intuition drives data analytics like in our case we would expect thursday is to have last most returns so if i were in that case i will do a, a seasonality analysis of my returns i will plot the returns of thursdays or opex and the other days and see if they are meaningfully the same right so there is a lot more to this um, than just monte carlo simulation and this analysis but this is just one starting point of assessing whether 2x of the drawdown um, was good enough or not so with that i think i've covered the article uh, praveen i know you have spoken once i had i know you had another question but i see sundar and um, theta i sorry would be handless i'll have them uh, speak first and praveen then we'll probably uh, get your question again if you don't mind so i'm going to yes, allow uh, thanks sundar and zubre khan theta eater sorry so um, um, both of you are not speakers but sundar if you want to start first uh, because you are first online and then we'll go to the theta uh, it was nice actually hearing you talk about 920 straddle and the article which you wrote earlier today it was really good uh, i have some questions let me start off with this question uh, most of the backtests which we run now is based upon the premise that the cost of trading a straddle was around 20 to top most like 30 or 40k so now the cost of trading has gone up really high uh, in the sense that after peak margin came in now if the cost of trading one straddle cost around minimum 2 lakhs now in in our indian market so is there a way that we can quantify how that will affect going forward that is my question first uh, i believe let's speak about that then if it is able to be answerable then i can ask the next question sure i i can try i can take a stab at that so you see in my analysis what i have assumed is i have assumed the capital of 2.25 lakhs or 225000 rupees mm-hmm. for the entire back test and you're right um, you know if you were trading these straddles in 2017 mm-hmm. you probably did not need that much margin uh, you know this is driven by the current margin state so you can essentially uh, you know in the code i have shared the code on the article it's in the github anybody who who can use python or any other coding language can easily Uh, see that, but it's also very easily possible to change your capital, uh, you know, based on the margin requirement to really create a more robust uh, return distribution. So, if uh, if I were try to try to do that, what I will say is, let's say the margin requirements changed uh, September twenty twenty or September twenty yeah September twenty twenty or so. I think they changed right uh, hmm. or twenty twenty one September. 2021. No, it started. It started from October two thousand twenty, and it, they phased in like phase one to phase, phase four, right. which yeah, right. which maxed around twenty twenty one. Yeah. Right, so, right, right, right. Yeah. So let's say if I I have all the date timestamps in my analysis, I can say okay. in my back test i'm going to assume so my back test you know this is a stock mock back test so it gives you an mm-hmm. absolute number of pnl 1000 rupees mm-hmm. 500 rupees 600 rupees right. for trading yeah. the strategy and they also take into account the lot sizes which essentially in your back test you should do as well so let's say i have 500 rupees uh, on 1 lakh 1 and a half lakh rupees in 2017 and mm-hmm. 500 rupees in 2020 will be different percentage returns right now my analysis assumes 200 225 or 2 lakh 25 for the entire yes. back test you can customize right. that you can say okay october to december 2020 i'll assume 1.6 or 1.7 mm-hmm. and so on and so forth again it's you know it could be seen as really curve fitting but i'm I mean, you know this is also 
realistic to assume ki if you were trading at that time you might have used that capital to and that might change your returns distribution that might change your drawdown it can change a lot of aspects of your uh, back test and analysis but yeah i think that's very easily doable now whether you can build a model to predict uh, in future there is no way because all these decisions are taken by sebi at their own you know at their own peril so to say uh, so they decide when what the margin should be and there is really no way to predict or, or you know uh, forecast that but you can definitely all right, make yeah. your analysis more uh, uh-huh. realistic right yes yes yeah i i got your answer on that so we can't actually uh, predict what may happen uh, coming years what may happen with the strategy that is one thing uh second thing is how about uh, how how can we quantify is there a way to say that if lot of traders are trading the same strategy because i too run one of the strategies 920 strategy in my system so i too trade it so what happens when lot of traders start trading the same system not the same system different variations but still punch the orders at 90 what really happens is there a is by, from your experience can you put something like uh this was one of the strategy which i know for 10 years back was working really well and a lot of people started trading it and there's a lot of returns came down so is there a way yeah. that you can tell anything like that in that yeah sure that's actually a very good question and you know uh, please forgive me for a probably a long answer that i'm going to try to give so return you know this is where the return attribution or the qualitative analysis that earlier i was talking about and i'll give you a couple of examples of things which have persisted through the time and things which have gone away so for example if you think about trend following trend following in indian markets have been there for a really long time whereas in us markets us equities uh, or us commodities global com- commodities there was a good bullish era of trend following in 1980s till early 2000s and then it has been flattening out right and that's the thing with trend analysis is that different asset classes will trend at different times so uh, that that is something which is more or less prone to uh, uh, you know not prone but more immune to uh, what do you call it cluster you know more people starting trade to trade it because it's a capacity it's the capacity for that strategy as a principle or that uh, style is a lot more lot lot more than what it used to be but having said that the reason probably it stopped working in at least in the us markets is a lot of ctf funds came up here which started trading a similar style uh, trend following and that's why the returns diminished at least on the principle on the theoretical basis you expect the returns to diminish uh, uh, when more people traded but it really depends on the effect like so for example the risk premium you know in the equity market so what that mm-hmm. says is in in theory it says that your equity markets are risky you are being compensated for the risk that you take because you know your equity can go down and the company can vanish and what not on a, on an overall basis and that's why you expect to earn a risk premium on the money that you have put in into equity markets now that is a what do you call it a fundamental feature of the market and expected to stay forever or you know at least for a good enough time until nobody can say for sure but you know it's expected to last much longer so if you are trading a strategy which is harvesting the risk premium which is essentially a buy and a hold of index for for lack of better word then you would expect it to continue working in the future as well so so that's those are the examples which are more robust or you know the capacity constraint is not that much but i'll also talk about where the capacity constraint is there you know which is so for example an arbitrage strategy and i'll talk about uh, you know in the years 2013 2014 in the crypto markets in the bitcoin space for example uh, a lot of exchanges were coming up and they would have because bitcoin or crypto is not a, a centralized market it is decentralized you will have different prices on different exchanges so essentially what you can do is you can buy from one exchange and sell on the another one without having to take that risk it was really riskless profit if you as long as you are able to uh, do that cross right now as more and more people started getting into it so this was called cross exchange arbitrage and as more and more people started doing it this vanished away because it was only this this kind of an effect was capacity constraint you can't have everybody trying to buy from one exchange and selling at the another because it will react you know the prices on the exchange on which you are buying will react to that demand so it was that sensitive to the order flow for an example right now when we you know with that thought when you come into the 920 saddle space and you know if earlier if you were on the space i talked about 
the profit drivers and the loss drivers of the strategy. So profit drivers being um, IVs remaining same and market uh, or IVs going going down and markets remaining in the range or IVs remaining the same or going down and markets trending. Both cases will help the 930 strategy and 920 strategy. And then in the loss scenarios where we're in IVs rise or market goes a V or W shape is where the losses will arrive. So now, you know, if I have to, we have to do a qualitative analysis, we have to see, okay, if 10,000 people, 10,000 traders, or let's not talk about in number of traders, think about the capital which is being deployed on this and the liquidity of your underlying which can digest that capital. Um, <coughs> that's where, I mean, it's not an easy answer, but I guess I'm trying to provide the thought that what can make this strategy crowded? Will it get crowded? Option mm. premium, volatility risk premium exists in the market. Everybody knows it. How you okay. extract that it's a different, is a different feature. So maybe 920 strategy okay. in its current form may or may not work. But, okay. you know, it, it, it may evolve into a new format. That, I would say that would be my answer. Okay, is there a way market will compensate for us putting more funds to trade the same system, which we have been barely putting like five times lesser, like two years back? For example, in 2018-19, it costed very less to trade a straddle. And now we put in more funds to trade the same system. So is there a way market may compensate? I'm just not asking market to compensate. Just asking, is there a way that it might do? The premiums might <clears throat> inflate or we might have a better returns on the funds which we are deploying in this strategy. Yeah. So you see, you have to think about in terms of the underlying risk and not from the capital that you're putting into it. You can trade the straddle with two lakhs. I can choose to trade the straddle with one lakh and much higher risk, assuming we get the margin. Somebody else might trade it with 10 lakhs with one straddle and have much less risk. So, you know, this this definition of risk is or as a capital driven risk is not really the risk of the strategy or risk of the market dynamics, right? Risk of the market dynamics is how how the premiums behave so the premiums don't go up because the margins have gone up the premiums will go up if the expected volatility or the implied volatilities will go up when there is a more uncertainty in the market and that's where the premiums will go up so margin i mean i could be personally very wrong but i think margin change of margin requirements may not reflect directly into the premiums now there is another effect that has taken place actually you know now that i speak about it because of the increased margins we have seen a lot of people have started buying otm hedges right as a result of which the otm hedging uh, prices like the 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 prices of right. otm have gone up right which right. essentially yeah. means the your skew of the iv curve or the you know if you plot your ivs of, across the strikes has changed so that is, you know, that is where the margin requirement affects the IV curve, which is the, you know, which you're trying to harvest. So yes, everything in the market will have an effect, but maybe not in the same fashion. So like you were saying, will market compensate us more because we have to put more capital? I don't think so. Not, not directly at least. All right. All right. Thanks, Sankit. Thank you. Thanks, Sundar. Okay. I'll, I'll have more speakers come up if they want to. Um, it's been been speak for a while. There were a few speakers I think they dropped off with the long conversation we've had. Uh, but I'm happy to take uh, any more questions if somebody might have. Okay, I have some coming up. All right, there you go. Okay. Hello, uh, kid. Zubin. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, hi, Angus. So uh, I've backtested the data, like uh, even I'm a system trader, like, like, but the thing is I, I trade in Nifty. So for three years, like 2019, 20 and 21 till June, till July, the lot size was 20, 75. And later the lot size has been reduced to 50 in Nifty. So, so like when we backtest the data, so, can, so after June, July, will I have to change my lots or the premium has been compensated for that? Hello. So, hey, sorry, uh, Wind Trader, can you just uh, wait for a minute? Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so you see lot size and premiums. So uh, let's think about it. When you look at a premium on the screen, it doesn't show you the lot size. So premium is for one option. Your lot size is 50, 50 of those. So when you see a premium of 400 rupees, 
on on bank nifty option let's say any option and you try and buy it you don't pay 400 you pay 400 into 25 which is a lot size so that lot size can change to 25 20 50 40 whatever might be the situation it will not have an effect of the, on the premium and the reason being if you if you look into the black scholes framework which is the most common framework to price the options there is no input of uh, the lot size itself so uh, the answer the simple answer is no the uh, the lot size is has no effect on the premium the the things which have effect on the premium are the underlying price the strike price time to expiry volatility and usually interest rate which you know practically is non existent or least of the uh, concern but lot size will not directly impact the premium uh, if that's what your question was okay okay sir so thank okay. you so, uh, so so the last question but the thing is like i i have seen the drawdown from uh, july it has been it has been more like 2019 20 21 uh, before like 2021 uh, was a uh, Uh, ex- exceptional like till february but uh, but after june the due to the premium like i i have the data of the premium also like the premium we used to get before and the premium we are getting now it is it is way too much right like so those those premiums are different due to the different volatility environment so you know in your you know pre covid era uh, or at least in 2017 2018 era there was not much volatility and that's why when you're writing so think you know how the option price i don't want to get into option pricing in the space but let me try to take a quick stab so think about an option um, insurance right uh, when you buy an insurance uh, if you have any form of illness or let's say if you're old age in which the insurance company thinks that you might be able to draw on that uh, insurance policy they'll charge you a high premium so the premium option premiums you know one of the option premiums uh, the reason it goes up is the uncertainty around uh, you know between the time you are buying or selling the option and the expiry so when there is more volatility there is more uncertainty which can lead that that option to be out of the money in the money and can you know the the payouts are very path dependent and that's why the option premiums are different than what they they were earlier also if you think about the index level so index level in uh, 2017 was what 12000 nifty now it is 17000 so one person move in 12000 or 12000 is different than one person move at 17000 so you know your option premiums will also expand with the uh, underlying level and that is why you will always see bank nifty options to be so you know the exercise you know if anybody wants to test it out you take the same volatility of two instruments and you take different levels your premiums will be different because your realized percentage moves on the volatility will be different right so an option with 10% volatility on let's say a stock which is itc of 100 rupees and 10% volatility of nifty will not be same price because that 10% move can lead to very different outcome in the underlying level so that's also the reason that your volatility the premiums are different the volat- different volatility environment and different underlying environment okay sir thank you so much sir thank you so thank much you. thank you all right win trader please go ahead well hi evening uh, well thank you for hosting the space anket and sorry i joined a bit late my question actually might might just have been answered if at all but please let me know in which case i'll just watch the recording but i want to ask you um that in the monte carlo simulation that you've done is are are some of these tools easily well i mean easily available on the net i presume and uh, i mean secondly of the sort of that bar bar chart diagram that you draw uh one is obviously to take the max drawdown <coughs> in that monte carlo as 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 one worst case scenario and then you know sort of work with it that okay if i get that then i'll probably stop the you know i mean straddle but is there a better way uh, to to you know look at it uh, i mean in, i mean in the terms that should i take more uh, uh, well i'm mean more an average of something out of that monte carlo and then look at it or something yeah so um, let me first answer your question around the tool so in the article that i shared um, um, i have also shared the code 
so anybody uh, who can code can take motivation from that code it's also on the google collab so you know which is a free uh, framework online yeah. from google uh, sure. so you can use that i mean you know it's the um, it's not like i use the pre canned packet i coded it up it's it's not difficult to code uh, so that's the answer and you know i think ami broker also has some monte carlo in their back test framework um, so that's the first uh, answer um, uh, the second question about uh, what you can do more you know uh, or if the what i have explained is uh, whole you know one and sole way and the answer is it's not you know the i wish the answer was really black and white and i did repeat uh, said that earlier as well the answer is really gray in the gray area what i have explained or what i have shown is one way of approaching this problem or analyzing what may happen um we've talked about if you will go back and listen to the space recording you will hear that we've talked about how uh, the straddle returns are more clustered uh, so the simple uh, monte carlo can be enhanced by taking those things into account uh, you can change it to uh, run on opex day or basically option expiry days separately or option expiry minus one day separately and so on and so forth so a lot more analysis can be done this is just the first step really what i tried to show sure sure thank you thank you ankit thank you all right uh, we have uh, option week uh, if that's your handle if you want to speak yeah uh, hi ankit uh, sorry for using an alias but uh, so but i have uh, an op- uh, one kind of observation or query for uh, your uh, monte carlo simulation or random walk so i just want to understand because this 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 kind of new thing for me uh, because i've heard about back tests and uh, which are you know which have some certain formats and which kind of simulate what has happened in the past but i am i am not able to quite fathom what your random walk is trying to do because I, as far as i can see ma- markets are not uh, uniformly random and uh, so um, even the even if you say markets are random they are, they are, they they exhibit different randomness on different times you know on different time scales so with with this your random walk you are act, you are trying to simulate market in a uniformly random way which i don't think is a correct way to model a market if market would have been uniformly random i don't think anybody in this world would have made money in the long term everybody would have would have lost because it's kind of as i say right it's it's just like a coin toss it's completely uniformly random so monte carlo simulation for me is also uniformly random simulation so you can't really structure it that way so for any strategy let alone this 920 but i don't think any strategy can actually in the markets can actually be simulated using a random walk that's what i believe what what are your thoughts on that right uh, very fair point so uh, markets are not random they are noisy as fuck but they are not random i agree with that completely um and i think i alluded to some of the uh, the question that you asked and some of the points on that uh, so monte carlo has that assumption like you said it's it's the randomization process it randomizes that so what we so you know when we do any kind of statistical analysis or modeling you come up with some some assumptions of your framework and and i think i've been repeating it again and again this is one one way of looking at things with that assumption that this is random i'm not saying the markets are random so let me let me try and you know pivot on this so markets have if you think about a very low signal to noise ratio what that means is uh, there is very you know if you look at the returns if you try to quantify the markets through a process or a model um, unlike electrical processes of physics which has very high signal to noise ratio markets or financial markets have very low signal to noise ratio uh, and that's why any model which you fit is uh, you know most likely to fit to uh, a uh, noise more and less uh, less to the uh, less to the real signal but when you create a strategy you are kind of doing a filtering on your underlying time series so you are creating a strategy with an expected cost profit profile means you are kind of filtering out the noise and bringing up a, a higher signal to noise ratio and thus when you do a random uh, randomization on that you are kind of defeating that purpose of the back test i agree with that completely and that's the you know that's why i say this is just the starting point the more robust way is to slice your data in more uh, meaningful buckets and fashions 
and do randomization on that so for example uh, the the return profile subjected to a conditional on the volatility environment and day of uh, day of the week or option expiry date these two variables if you condition your back test on these two variables and do randomization on those buckets so to say that will be much more meaningful randomization and monte carlo so you're right monte carlo is just a very initial starting point and again my uh, uh what do you call it my aim of writing this article was to you know the hypothesis that 2x of the maximum drawdown in the historically back test is a good enough measure i wanted to test and challenge that and not really to say and uh, propagate that monte carlo is the only and the best way of uh, doing this analysis it's 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 a start it's one you know for me you know in a scale you know on a on a platter of the, uh, 20 analytics uh um, that i might do this is one of those so so you're right i and i agree with you completely um yeah thank you no problem arun can we can we listen to you yeah now? yeah thanks ankit for your article and the code so what i wanted to check like have you done any modeling on predicting the stock price and what kind of probability you found there if any <clears throat> so yeah uh, predicting uh, any modeling in stock so a stock prediction through modeling is a very usually a futile exercise uh you will when you create a model and try to fit data to it in your historical analysis you will come up with a very good model which will fit to uh, exactly what the price is coming up to be but then when you try and test it out out of sample so you know in the concept of in sample and out of sample for those who might have never heard of it uh, so let's say you have 10 years of data of stock prices uh, and you want to build a model to say okay you know daily i want to forecast my daily price uh, on on the basis of 10 years of data i want to build a model now usually a good practice is to divide that data into in sample and out of sample so what i mean by that is let's say you divide this data into 70 and 30 so 7 years is your in sample data and 3 years your out of sample data you build a model which will fit to the 7 years of data you build a model which will show you less errors and you know whatever your parameters of regression or whatever machine learning you want to do you do it on the 7 years of data and then you drink, then take those parameters and run it for the 3 years which the the back uh, the model fitting process uh, or regression analysis has not seen and you will often find that it will quickly deteriorate and the reason being like i was saying earlier there's a very high uh, very low signal to noise ratio in markets and when you kind of very naively try and fit uh, a model to stock prices or stock returns it will fit to a lot of noise and not really to the signal uh, so in my experience uh, creating models to predict stock prices or stock returns in a simplistic way is a futile exercise uh, you really have to club it with a lot more analysis and lot more other techniques or ensembles to really make something useful out of it and even then it will be uh, very noisy it will not be very definite outcome that you can make uh, i hope that answers your question yeah so ankit uh, what i want to say is like we have these uh, all signals like mscd uh, or uh, some 10 day am i going over that so can some model be built on that which uh, again gives a high probability uh, that you should buy or uh, so it's whether the stock price will go up or down means just that uh, increasing the chance uh, even if not predicting it like what would be the price yeah so see uh, all these indicators are useful in some format but they are all past looking they are always you know none, no nothing is created yeah um, in forward looking basis and uh, predicting the stock prices and returns is is usually very hard you know so i'll take an example of trend following what does trend following do you know in a simplistic way they don't know when the trend will end they just want to latch on to one which is running which is already in in motion and you can have cutoffs for your motion but it is in motion and you want to latch on to that but it doesn't forecast it doesn't it can't forecast forecasting models are not easy to build in uh, in the financial space and less so with uh, moving averages and macds these are 
uh, hindsight looking indicators which can which can be used very well to come up with the current state of the market and maybe if you if you are sophisticated about it you can use the current state of the market to feed into a model which can probably based on the historical analysis can give you an outcome to say where the next state will be like you know there's a process called markov chain process but i don't want to get into that and you know in a simplistic answer is it's it's not that easy you know these uh these indicators will not really help you um it may help you build trading systems as such uh, a combination of these trading like i said you know in a simplest is one is trend following if you are able to use these indicators say now we are in trend and we want to buy it can definitely help you but it will not help you kind of predict where it ends or where it will where should you get out of it you know um so that answer is yeah, the question yeah thanks sankit of course uh we have uh, anil anil budhani to speak next uh mr anil can you can you hear me do you want to speak or sure <clears throat> i okay i'm going to move to the next speaker uh, nitesh nitesh parik is my speaker on now okay yeah yeah now uh, mr anil is speaking so nitesh if you can hold please uh, mr nitesh can speak yes thank oh, you very much mr anil yeah mr. option mr. 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 nitesh can you you may continue Absolutely. you may continue yeah. can i continue yes yes please please carry on yes yes thank you very much i have been listening to you and it is very informative and i wanted to ask like uh, what is your suggestion on the stranger or you are only talking about this trader i am actually agnostic i am not really talking about straddle or strangle i just you know if you look at the article that i had created and posted on my twitter timeline uh it doesn't matter if it's a straddle or strangle it is just trying to build an analytical framework on uh taking the returns of your strategy and kind of doing some analysis on it to see uh what kind of potential drawdowns or uh, it can occur so it uh, this i mean we're not trying to discuss which is a better strategy which we are trying to do uh is slightly analytical analysis on the underlying returns all right all right thank you okay thank you uh nitesh do you want to speak next <clears throat> nitesh hello yes uh, yeah ankit uh, is such a nice informative discussion is uh, give lots of to everybody uh, i i just uh, uh, having the confusion about that the dynamics of market so everybody is talking about the dynamics market is very dynamic and uh, lots of people are creating lots of strategy even i have created lots of strategy for myself so but the point is that how we are tapping the dynamics of the market because we are just back testing the data of last 10 year 20 year we are creating the straddles strangles and everything i haven't seen the people who can categorize or classify the nature of market this is the uh, you know one of the thing which need to be addressed i may be wrong lots so, of strategies are here yeah, yeah. nitesh probably the reason is because it's very hard to quantify and categorize the markets looking uh, this is a, this is the problem uh, ankit uh, uh, there are lots of straddle 920 straddle 925 straddle 930 straddle lots of people are doing the optimize trying to optimize it but if it is so wealthy if it is so uh, to the point then everybody will try to do it and every will but he will definitely do it but the point is whatever kind of strategy we are making and we are trying to deploy in the market we must be aligned with the nature of the market this is and this is a point where i think that that we are some somehow misaligning and that is the reason that uh, no strategy works 
very well in the market so nitesh i would so there are two points i would like to say right earlier in the space uh, hopefully you'll get to see uh, hear the recording i talked about what drives the profit and loss of this 920 strategy uh, so you know it's it's the dynamics of the market itself is dynamic now you should also understand markets are evolving they they change so it's probably not the you you created a strategy today based on the dynamics of current market Mm-hmm. and markets will change tomorrow next week and a month two months six months down the line and you'll have to adapt to it so it's not that you can create a strategy which will run forever that will never happen no no hedge fund global no big short traders have been able to maintain the same strategy and run it for 10 20 years because the markets change so that's the nature of the market and i, I think that's the way to approach it uh, there's nothing wrong with adapting your approach to the new market like like we when you say they're optimization thing, uh, I, uh, uh, ankit another thing i want to tell you uh, uh, i just i just want to add it that everybody is talking about the algo trading the uh, there is emotionless trading everywhere the uh, big fiis dis are doing the algo trading i think that market is somehow know it that algo trading is booming is flushing in the market so uh, what i what i uh, experienced it that if you have some human emotion in the trading because trading is just a business if you will involve your human emotion in the uh, in your trading you will get the more benefit i have experienced it because market will so hit your sorry, sl sorry to sorry to in- interrupt here uh, you know i don't want to get into the interaction of uh, what the Uh, algo market is on the emotions because that's not really the topic uh, i would like to rather have it focused on uh, the strategy degradation or you know the analysis that we can do uh, so i i like to speak to the uh, uh, sorry to the next but speaker. i have to uh, read your article himanshu uh, uh... sorry himanshu can you speak i'm not sure if himanshu can Uh, Himanshu, can you hear us? If you want to speak, otherwise we'll move to the next speaker. Okay, now, now I think okay, you're able to hear me. Okay, so what I wanted to know is, uh, I saw some Arima model of uh, linear regression on the time and data series. So, like say that if there is a set of data for not a very ten year or longer period, but let us say that for monthly futures, this month's data. and if it is uh, if it is encapsulated uh, with the arima model some points of uh, re- you know reversals and the next level can be predicted so is it true it is uh, viable to do so like where they count the normal rotational count of the instrument like uh, i saw one quantitative analysis group gunjan dua and uh, gang inter from australia they i saw one of the training program they said that like for bnf future the count is 200 so once you see that if it is refer, uh, returning from that point it would then further go to the you know mean and then uh, go to the another deviation that so is based on uh, linear regression yeah i know so let me try and answer that uh, quickly without taking any names so first of all that's not linear regression uh that's i've seen uh, the reference that you're making uh, and that's way way away they are just using the name linear regression and arima but that's not the case first of all second of all even if you uh, if anybody who thinks that's the case it's not too difficult to get free data online uh, historical nifty data and try it out and test it out uh, that 200 day cycle and you know what happens so you know what happens is when you look at chart it's very easy to say oh yeah every 200 day it moves but when you no no 200 point exactly. not 200 day 200 point okay, okay 200 point you know so it uh, moves in multiple of 200 points I'm, what they mean to establish is it moves in a multiple of 200 points bank nifty future once it has crossed 200 it will touch 400 if it has crossed 400 it might touch 600 and then 800 if it reverses from any point then it would reverse in the same manner and this sir, is how i think uh, yeah sir, sorry one question you know if you think about it 200 points on nifty is what percentage of nifty bank bank nifty bank nifty even on bank nifty it's much smaller percentage right 200 points yeah. on 35000 is was 0.1% less than that right 
so that is expected right agar if you if you look at that if you if you compare that to let's say reliance stock or itc stock and you take a 0.1% range of that utna to move karega hi so that's <laughs> that has nothing to do linear with linear regression or arima arima is additionally an auto regressive integrated moving average model it's a linear regression mm-hmm. model not the way it has been propagated on that website so i don't want to go into that uh, discussion uh, if you have question on this analysis that we've done i'm happy to take it up otherwise i'd like to move to the next uh, next speaker okay. okay thank you all right thank you arun arun can you hear us uh, i don't think arun is able to we'll wait for arun hitesh if you want to speak next um am i audible hitesh hitesh can you okay uh i'm going to the move to the next one karthik <coughs> karthik can you hear me you want to speak in... hey uh, karthik so yeah uh, can you hear me yeah karthik please yeah actually you know this um, actually for the last two weeks uh, we have a high weeks market like uh, um, um, how do you we uh, like uh, you know uh, one day like it uh, the nifty was uh, went uh, 5% down so in that case uh, uh, like how do we uh, like at least uh, manage the uh, loss and uh, come out Uh, any adjustment strategies uh, that you Karthik, recommend sorry 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 to sorry to cut you off uh, so we are not discussing how to manage the strategy or straddle this space was created to uh, talk about the article that i created about the monte carlo simulation and the drawdowns uh, the manual adjustment i am first of all completely automated algorithmic trader i don't have any adjustments in the day and whatever and again this is not really the scope of the discussion today so mm-hmm. if you want to uh, maybe read the article and uh, come back with questions i have you know the recording of space will be available but the idea is to kind of provide a statistical analytical framework to assess the returns and see what kind of drawdowns it may hit uh, but not the adjustment so i'll have to excuse you on that uh, and move to the next speaker uh, praveen if you want to speak again hello yeah uh, ankit can you hear me yes yes please yeah so earlier actually you uh, answered my query and now the second part of it i would like to get some insight from your side uh, regarding this i had already posted you my comment uh, in the morning in twitter uh, most of the uh, back testing uh, strategies which are currently being traded by most of the traders usually we talk about only uh, value drawdown in percentage terms there is another aspect to it which is time drawdown so i would like to understand whether similar simulation can be done in terms of time drawdown the way you have done for percentage uh, drawdown if we do it for say uh, particular uh, in particular week suppose we get 3 days time drawdown in particular uh, year suppose we get continuously 10 days time drawdown or say 2 months time drawdown if we put together and try to understand what is the maximum time drawdown and similarly if we do monte carlo analysis for 10000 runs and can we use that to decide when we should stop our strategy or so, can Praveen, we do the combination of uh, value drawdown maximum drawdown as well as time drawdown Yeah, like Praveen. So if you if you think yeah. about it, the simulation here again go back to the article which is on my Twitter timeline. I if somebody has yeah. just joined the space, uh, there's an article that I posted, uh, my medium article from this morning on my Twitter timeline. Um, so the simulations that you have done, which is mm. different ten thousand different paths of uh, uh, of of the same strategy, you know, being simulated in the Monte Carlo. 
uh, all of these strategies because they are coming up with different drawdowns they are also coming up with different drawdown days right so if you if you look at that chart again if you look at that uh, analysis of the or the one which was only with four paths you will see the time into drawdown and time out of the drawdown in each of those four paths which the initial analysis was will be different so what you are saying is essentially already embedded in the analysis is that that information i have not extracted out uh, and but you are right we can do a combination of uh, like a joint distribution for you know somebody who's more sophisticated uh, or wants to do that but otherwise you can do singular analysis as well just like we did the analysis for maximum drawdown or the distribution of the drawdown you can also do a distribution of the worst time in the drawdown right and you can see okay in the historical in my main uh, the first back test i created my let's say i'm i'm just taking these numbers randomly okay um, let's say in my initial uh, draw uh, back test i say the the drawdown period was 3 months but when i did the simulation and i you know draw a distribution of the time drawdown the it may vary all the way from 15 days to 7 months and you can do the similar kind of cutoffs the 95 percentiles and all in that to come up with a you know in a univariate way or in a singular metric way of the time drawdown so that's one analysis what you can also do is a joint analysis or joint distribution in which you are taking these time drawdowns as one series and you are taking the maximum drawdowns as another series and then trying to plot a joint distribution of it so uh, you know instead of the distribution chart that you see histogram that you see which is the two axes it will have a third axis in it like so it's a 3d graph with in which two distributions are being changing and it's a more complicated one now uh, this can be done now whether this makes sense so when we do bivariate analysis or two variables you know you look at the distributions of them uh, together you usually want them to be having effect on one one and having effect on another so what i mean by that is um, I, if i ask you a question do you think the the value of the drawdown or the size of drawdown will also impact the days the answer would most likely for this 920 standard strategy will be no i don't i can't definitely say that uh, uh, a a value a level of the drawdown like say a high level of drawdown will also mean a high level of time drawdown so these two variables might not be causation based or they might be not you know in a simplistic or again not the correct way uh, correlated so whether that whether that analysis makes sense or not is another question so you know with data analytics the thing is uh, there's a concept called garbage in garbage out you feed feed it garbage it's going to give out the garbage so you know and that's why it's important i've been stressing on that this is just one step or the first step of doing this analysis you have to structure your analysis so that it makes sense you can do a, a lot of it with this but whether it will make sense or not is another question i hope that answers um uh, yeah uh, for 920 straddle whatever you pointed out i think it is correct but what i wanted to ask this is about ten, trend following strategies because what happens is in trend following strategies most of the cases value drawdown would be severe because there might be especially if we consider positional strategies wherein there could be adverse gaps against you so it may happen that there would be huge uh, value drawdown in couple of days but same uh, drawdown would be covered in next couple of days the way it happened yeah. in last week there was one day 5% gap down immediately next day it was covered almost 70% of it so in such cases what happens is although you are saving maximum time drawdown uh, sorry maximum value drawdown it would be covered in just couple of days so in this particular case you will have very less time drawdown but in trend following system there might be certain period where market would be in very tightly consolidated range where value drawdown would be very less but time drawdown could be extended to 3 to 4 months i guess right. you are getting my point yeah so i absolutely cases, the way you have given example of gold and usd chart so in that case what is happening is value drawdown is pretty less but time drawdown is considerably stretched so in such cases and so one has to be very uh, acknowledged about whether that strategy should be executed or stopped considering only time drawdown because although he is not uh, losing much of his money he is losing his time right so we have to decide at one point whether that strategy should be executed or not that right, is right. what uh, i wanted to say 
No, absolutely I, correct. And then again, again, it's captured some of it in, in my article that you know uh, the qualitative analysis. And earlier in the spaces you were there, I remember when we were talking about the PNL attribution of this 920 strategy, or even the trend following any strategy that you run, the PNL attribution is very important, and that alone can't help. A quantitative analysis alone can't help. Qualitative analysis alone alone can't help. It has to be really a combination of the two, depending because there's so many moving parts, so many moving variables for a given strategy. And for the trend following, I can also give you example. You know, the 2020 COVID crash was, you know, maybe lasted three weeks or two and a half weeks, and then market was in a steady upturn. But if you look, go back in history and look at the global financial crisis. Uh, or you know 2008 or even the earlier periods where the drawdowns or you know the markets were in a bearish mode you will see the the time drawdown and the value drawdown profile to be very different so right right you know it, it requires what do you call it more analysis but definitely you you know your your approach and your thoughts are absolutely correct i you know no no challenge for that um thanks um, thank you thank you and s but if you want to speak next Hello. Hey. Hello. Can you yes. hear? Yes. Actually, my question was I I was gone through your uh, this um, paper regarding this uh, backtesting and the Monte Carlo simulation. My question was very technical. Whether you have any GitHub repository about yes. the process? Yeah, hmm? yeah. So if you if you look at the article at the bottom, the I have uh, uh, linked the. Um, the GitHub code for this. So it's all done in Python, right? It's in Python, yeah. And uh, it, it is for 248 days, I suppose? Data? It's for five years. No, no, it's for five years. It's for 2017 okay. to 2022 until last week. Wonderful. It, it was a wonderful analysis. Thank you for posting it. So oh, rare. No Nobody posted. Uh, very rarely post their analysis like this. Thank you. Oh, of course, thank you. No problem. Um, Har, Hari, Hari, I'm sorry. I'm just reading your handle. Uh, do you want to speak next? Harris, Harris, sorry. I'm not sure if they are able to listen to us. I'm gonna. Um, okay, we've been running this for two hours or so. If you have. I have any other questions people who want to maybe come up ask questions again uh, to reset the room this is in uh, reference to an article i posted on my twitter timeline this morning uh, it looks at a strategy which is a 920 popular strategy 920 straddle and it tries to analyze whether uh, the simple heuristic of using two times your back test, uh, drawdown as a stopping point for your strategy makes sense or not and it does some some statistical analysis very introductory analysis again uh, so we've been trying to discuss that uh, with that said we have another speaker uh, dhaneshwar suryavanshi do you want to speak okay i, I can't I'm not sure okay. if I can. oh there you go, oh, there you go. hello <clears throat> um, okay, they're on mute again. Uh, we have Amrut coming up. Um, if they are able, let's, let's see. Okay. Hello, Amrut. Okay. Um, I'm going to remove one speaker. Okay. Um, Amrut is still coming up. Okay, uh, I think we are running out of questions from people. Uh, again, we'll probably keep this line open for five more minutes for uh, if anybody wants to come up, have a question uh, that uh, they want to be answered. Um, again, I can stay on for a few more minutes. Uh, uh, the article is on my timeline uh, from this morning or my Twitter feed, if you want to call it. Uh, Mr. Surya Vanshi, are you able to speak now? <coughs> no, oh, I don't think so. Okay. Um, I, okay, I, right. I'm going to wait out for 30 more seconds. 
uh, maybe 60 more seconds i don't i've covered the article uh, again it's on my timeline it's on it's a medium article um the recording of this space is i'll definitely keep, uh, be able to post on twitter um with that said uh, for 30 more seconds 60 more seconds if we don't have any questions i'm gonna end this space um sorry about not being able to integrate this with youtube i was doing this space for the first time uh, i've had uh, quite a few webinars in the past uh, for video screen shares so uh, they worked fine for some reason uh, this one did not uh, but i'll try and uh, maybe create a short synopsis video for this and post it on youtube for anybody who might be listening to this later on and might want to uh, uh, you know, see the code or maybe have a code walkthrough uh, if they want to. Uh, but for now, I'll likely be. Hey, hey, Amrit. Oh, hello, but I'm not able to hear you, but I can read your captions. Uh, some problem in, in my mobile. Uh, I just wanted. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to know, like, six, uh, like uh, in 2017, the drawdowns of any strategies, let it be a BP, uh, BP 920 straddle or 940, 950 straddle, it was around just around 4 to 5k per lot, and it has been increasing drastically year on year. Like, uh, if we consider that point of time, it has been uh, 4k to 8k, 12k, now it has been around 25k, for example, 920 strategy. Uh, so, like, uh, uh, at one point of time, from 4k, it has been uh, doubled, tripled four times. And we can't uh, just uh, we can't just decide we can just uh, stop the strategy at when the drawdown has been uh, doubled. And uh, is the increase in the premiums that has been occurred from 2017 to 2021 uh, has uh, has it been any uh, effect on this? And uh, should we reduce our position size when the premiums gets increased due to maybe underlying price uh, increase increase or volatility increase? What do you have the thoughts on this? Yeah, so uh, thanks for that question. We did discuss some of this earlier in the space, uh, but let me try and reiterate what I said. Um, so, you know, the option premiums uh, are a function of the underlying price. So in 2017, your Nifty was 12,000 or whatever that level was. Yeah. Now it is close to 16 to 7, 17. So, you know, the, the in terms of 1% move, if you talk about it back then, my stuff must have been 120 uh, points. And then now it is 170 points. So by just by the fact that the base of your underlying has moved up, your premiums will also move up in the same, same fashion. So that's why even if the volatility remains the same or even if the implied volatility that the market is expecting to realize in future remains the same your option premiums will change with respect to the underlying uh, underlying mark uh, uh, index, okay? okay now having said that uh, i don't think it's fair to look at absolute pnl uh, over the time because it will always happen like if you run a 10 year back then uh, 10 years ago 1000 rupees uh, profit and the 10 uh, today 1000 rupees profit is not the same until unless you normalize it to either index levels or to the capital that you've been trading. So my analysis that I used, I, it's all percentages because percentages are comparable. 10% 10 years ago and 10% today is comparable. But 10,000 rupees 10 years ago and 10,000 rupees today is not. Yeah. So if you want to do that analysis, uh, I would suggest you normalize it to either index level or to uh, your capital base. And that will help you... Uh, uh, get some more uh, perspective. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, whether that means the strategy has been deteriorating, maybe, maybe not. And, you know, when I drew that uh, Monte Carlo analysis on the article, uh, since I was using percentages, uh, you know, actually, if you look at my GitHub uh, notebook, uh, it has a scatter plot, which shows that uh, the returns, I mean, you know, percentage returns have also grown up, grown up, uh, uh, widened like it has gone both ways positive and negative and that is a function of the underlying volatility of the market in the last two years so a lot of things change and that's why we kind of trying to draw these tools or uh, use these tools to uh, make sense of what has changed right um, but yeah with with volatility or expected volatility your premiums will also change 
whether that changes or whether that impacts your or how it impacts your uh, uh, strategy performance we've discussed that earlier in the space today so if yeah, you yeah. go back to and uh, listen to that recording anybody else who might have later joined if they go back and listen to that recording you might be probably able to get that on that kind of uh, answer or a comment yeah, fine fine all right thank you okay um i think i think i'm going to end this uh, i don't have any other speakers uh, maybe 5 15 more seconds uh, i think uh, we've run out of time if we have covered the agenda uh, anybody who uh, i've been getting a lot of uh, questions uh, they were uh, on the article that i posted uh, on my tweet and there have been so many sub tweets and threads people have discussed a lot of approaches a lot of has been it has been centered around 920 straddle i kind of picked that up because that's a strategy that everybody understands and can discuss at length uh, but this kind of analysis can be done for any form of strategy and again uh, i can't insist this enough this is just first step of the kind of analysis that you want to do uh, it's uh, you know the uh, the realm is way wider and way deeper uh, on that um okay um so i'm just going to wait 10 15 more seconds and then we'll just probably end out so uh, thanks everybody who's be, who joined listened in i hope you derived uh, some value and help out of it my dms are always open if you want uh If you have any questions or follow-ups on the article, I'm happy to answer. Please don't message me saying how to do adjustments or what is the best strategy to trade. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll not be able to answer those questions. Uh, but if you want to uh, challenge my analysis or provide some alternate views or get some clarity replicating some of the code, or if you need data on the uh, strategy, I'll be more than happy to provide that. Uh, okay. With that said, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm going to just end it. Thank you.